Okay, before I run the overlap tool, um, I want to take a look at the files that I'm, I'm hoping to summarize. Um, I feel pretty good about the habitat layers. They're pretty simple geometric objects. I don't think that the computer is going to hurt itself trying to summarize those. So I think we're happy with the habitats. The wetlands basic area I created um, from, it was actually from a file called uh, wetland characteristics, which I downloaded, but then I, I dissolved and did a couple different things. Um, we'll talk about dissolve in a second. Um, to create a simpler file for this overlap tool so that when we report by watershed it doesn't get kind of gummed up um, or it doesn't crash the computer. So I want to look at conserved lands and we're going to look at another version of the file under boundaries here and it's going to be uh, conserved lands by holder name and at face value they look like the same file. Um, I can I could categorize this one as well by um, holder name and I would end up with a very similar looking um, kind of categorized file. The difference is that I ran a tool called dissolve on conserved lands with attributes. So this this attribute table had um, you know holder name and there's kind of these redundant categories for every time Booth Bay Region Land Trust owns a parcel, right? So we could kind of go and see what are called kind of single part objects where every single geography lines up exactly to um, to a record in an attribute table. And when you dissolve by an attribute, and I dissolved on holder name, it kind of creates what are called multi-part features, or sometimes it can actually combine the features. Um, if they're next to each other, it'll get rid of the boundary and create one new polygon based on adjacent polygons. But um, we'll take a look at, at what this did to um, this kind of conserved lands by holder name. And now there's only one feature for each one. And so if we were to look at that same Booth Bay Region Land Trust, it selects all of these all of these guys, right? So a multi-part feature is a single record um, in a shapefile that has multiple geographies that are kind of usually non-contiguous like this. If you were to run a, um, well actually let's see, this might be a good example right here. So here's an example of three single part objects that um, we dissolve them and they they have combined to be kind of one uh, one feature. So they became one feature. But um, it's kind of confusing, but it's really important when you're doing vector work to remember the difference between single part and multi part because um, if we were to calculate area, for instance, for instance, right now, the area of this multi part object would be all the sum of all of these places and it would it would record their area kind of just as one thing for that whole record. Um, so you might have heard of the tools multi-part to single part and single part to multi-part and it's confusing to remember but um, the the tool you may use this week is multi-part to single part which is taking something like this and it would split non-contiguous pieces back into kind of single part features with different records. So um, we're actually going to run this multi-part feature, uh, this multi-part shape file, um, instead of this one here. And the reason we're doing that is because sometimes algorithms tend to, every single record, they'll try to do a piece of the algorithm over and over again. So I, I dissolved it just to kind of simplify, um, hopefully, what the tool will have to process. So I'm going to get rid of this one with attributes because we don't need all of these different geographies everywhere. It's it's simpler to use the dissolved um, multi-part version. Um, and so now I'm just going to I'm going to actually just turn them all on so we can see them. And <laughs> let's see if it runs. That's always the fun thing to do. So I'm going to go to your processing toolbox and look for overlap analysis, right? and it's under vector analysis. I don't think it's up in this toolbar over here. I think you have to search for it. So overlap analysis, and we want our input layer to be um, the mid-coast wetlands, which are, oh, sorry, sorry, mid-coast watersheds. And we want our overlay layers to be the three habitats and the conserved lands and the what was it? Yeah, the wetlands one, the wetland basic area. So those are the five categories that we're interested in summarizing. Um, now, 
if your computer is having a hard time, I think this will run if you if you were to do it more like one at a time or even in sections, like you could do the three habitats and then you could do the wetlands and then you could do the conserved lands. So you might want to try to run it with just one before doing doing them all. <laughs> um, I'm going to run them all because I'm pretty sure it's going to work for my computer. And I don't want to create a temporary layer. I want to create um, a final layer. I'm going to do what I normally do, which is go to my sandbox and I'm creating a kind of summary analysis. So I'm just going to call this uh, summary summaries by watershed in case we create more files. And I'm going to save this as um, watersheds uh, underscore maybe with attributes, uh, with summary attributes perhaps. Attributes. And I think you'll notice that I'm, I'm I'm kind of ridiculous about my naming schemes. I I have a system. I suggest you get one. Um, it doesn't have to be the same as mine, but it's very useful to have kind of set ways of naming things. Um, so I'm going to just hit run, and I, I hope that will work. It looks like it is. Yep. Great. And like I said before, if yours did, did not run or it was running really slowly, then try to ch change the parameters and only put through a few elements at a time. Um, but that should be that should be good. So now we've got this, and let's open up the attribute table and see what it did. So now, of course, we have to wade through the attribute table and see what's being represented. Um, and because I've used this before, I kind of know what it's what it what it's saying, and I'll I'll just kind of tell you. <laughs> um, what it's reporting is the area in the first column and the percentage of coverage that that area does for each watershed in the second column and it's doing that for each attribute or sorry each feature that we wanted to see the overlap for so we've got um you know and it's kind of annoying because these these always get truncated and and that happens in in dot dbf files which is the native file format for tables in in shape files so um this is the conserved land area this is the conserved land uh, percentage this is the um this is the deer wintering area habitat area and percentage inland waiter etc 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 and so um, if you want to kind of spot check you're welcome to you can kind of do that by um, selecting a watershed you know and you can kind of go let's see where's that watershed right <laughs> I just picked one that happened to be just the islands of a certain bay right but um, these are all different watersheds that you can kind of go and um, and get a sense of whether or not you think that, that those percentages are right. Before I ran this lab, I, d I did look to see, um, I performed a few intersects to see if, if the tool was operating properly. And, and so far in my experience, it, this tool has been, it's pretty good. It does a good job. And so I trust it. So um, the one thing we might do just to do a quick double check, which I think would be interesting, is let's try to do um, our own percentage for one of these columns to see if it checks out. And you might be asking, well, okay, I think I, I know how to calculate area for vector objects. We can do that. Um, what kind of unit is this? This is just spitting something out, and how do I know what unit it is? Um, in Q, it, we tend to always, um, the tools will just run the base unit of the projection. So we're not going to get terribly into projections, but if you're in a projected coordinate system, meaning you can't be in WGS84 or NAT83 alone, um, you can use those datums, but you need to be in a projected coordinate system, then the base unit um, will be something you can usually find in the, you know, the Proj4 code or, um, you know, the, in the actual projection kind of language. And so, the base unit for um, UTM 19 North, which is what we use for most of Maine, is is meters. And almost all of the units you'll find in, in New England for projected coordinate systems will be meters unless it says unless it says feet. So occasionally when I work with um, planners, they like to design in feet, so we'll intentionally choose um, you know a, a, f a feet based system. But so what does that mean? So this is meters, and what that means is that these coordinates down here, right, are literally just a flat Cartesian plane 
of however many meters from however many meters from an origin. And so that's what that's that's how it's using and calculating kind of the the units of the area. So so anyway, um, if we know that they're square meters, then let's go and calculate the area for each of these watersheds. And so to do that, we're going to open this back up and we're going to open our um, field calculator. And I'm going to call this um, area and we'll make it a real. So we want it to be a, a decimal, something that can have a decimal. Um, I'm going to make it big because they're they're pretty big and I don't want it to lose anything. So I'm going to go 20. I don't care a ton about the precision here because a meter is pretty accurate for this scale. And, but I'm going to still give it a couple decimal places, but I don't need to have a bazillion decimal places. I don't, I don't think that's necessary. So now um, the dollar sign area is the way to get the field calculator to report for every record in the upcoming field that we're creating, how to have it just kind of report, okay, what are the square meters for that object? And so um, I could just do that, and I'll do that right now. So area, that's good, okay. So this is my my area figure for each of the um, for each of the watersheds. And now let's say I wanna calculate a percentage, right? I can go back here again, and I'm gonna just say, test because we're testing to see if our percentage calculation is close to their percentage the tools percentage calculation so I'm going to say so that's called a test we'll make it a real and go 22 and I'm going to say I want to take the let's take their measurement of area conserved lands and divide it by our area and I think you can kind of tell at this point that um, if if I wanted to, I could just use that dollar sign area again right here. I don't you don't need to always create fields every time. You can kind of summon that same um, tool as you go along. You don't need to always create separate fields for every object that you're you're creating in this statement here. Um, so either way, I'm getting. 0.027 so if I multiply it by 100 you get a percentage point then it looks like and I kind of like this about Q it it provides an example output so that you get a preview and it's usually the first record so I see this um, we've taken conserved land divide by area multiply by 100 and I'm getting 2.7577 and so to multi like hundreds of thousands if not millions of decimal points we're getting the same thing. So th this is just for me to say that, yes, I trust the tool. I don't think I need to run this actually. Um, it's just an unnecessary column. So now the question though is, um, I don't think that our clients will appreciate us reporting in millions of square meters or hundreds of thousands of square meters. So we'll, we'll, we'll create a reporting column or reporting unit that's more meaningful um, to them. And so um, what I'm going to do is show you how to do one, and then I'll let you do the rest of them, and we'll move on to the second part of the video. So to calculate acreage, we would just say, okay, let's call this, these are the um, acres, and I'm gonna make a code for myself, CL for conserved land. We're gonna call that a real, and then we'll have an output length of 22. I just kind of do that anyway, even though I know it doesn't need to be that long probably. And we're going to take um, conserved land, and of course we have to do a unit multiplier. Um, Google is always great. Just Google search um, how many square meters per acre, and you'll figure it out. Um, I do this a lot, so it's 4046.86 is the is the unit multiplier, or, or sorry, the dividing what you should divide by to get um, the number of acres per square meter. Um, yeah, and I, you know, depending on how you go about it, I think occasionally it makes more sense to divide by something, and sometimes it makes more sense to multiply by something. So we can kind of talk about that. But so acres, conserved land, okay. I think that's correct. Cool. So now we're seeing how many acres um, per watershed there are of conserved land. So that's kind of cool. And because we trust this, we can just use this as our um, as our column for the percentage. 
So I think we're done there. So go ahead and um, figure out the acreages for all the other columns and we'll move on. Okay, so mine worked pretty well and um, I got that, that all figured out. I think I'm gonna delete these square meters columns because I, I don't need them and they're just gonna clutter up my table. So um, to do that, I'll go edit to delete column make sure I don't delete the wrong ones. I'm going to do these, every other one. Um, there we go. I think that's correct. So the one with the underscore one that I believe is right. Yeah. Okay, so now I've got my percentages if I need them and I've got my area for the whole thing and I've got that. So, you know, you might also actually would be good to do that one as well. <laughs> so I'm gonna go and do that really quick. Okay, so I just calculated the acres of the entire, of each watershed as well. And I think that'll be helpful. I'm gonna hit save and we're gonna set this aside because we're not gonna use it yet. Um, for the rest of the video, I'm going to show you how to do some terrain analysis. Um, I mean, they're just basic terrain tools. So you may, you may be familiar with these already, but we're gonna create a hill shade we're going to do a hypsometric tint and then make some contours as well. Okay, the reason we're doing um, this terrain stuff is that um, you have the option to work in Illustrator again this week instead of the new tools, which we're gonna show in the next few videos. Um, you know, we're gonna show you some Tableau, but um, it's good to know how to make it an attractive um, kind of base map or a physical map from the ground up. So if you haven't done that, that's kind of what this is for. And now we'll bring in the, go under terrain, and we've got a dem.tiff that you can bring in. And so um, a dem, I think you, or most of you have seen one of these before. This is a digital elevation model, which is the generic term for, the, term for them. Um, next week, I will distinguish between kind of a dtm, a dsm, and a dcm, which are kind of the, the terrain um, surface and canopy, which are occasionally things you'll encounter but for this week we're just it's just an elevation model every pixel represents elevation and they come in kind of this black to white as a standard symbology um, the first thing we'll do I think the most the simplest and, and best thing you can do to kind of help the average person see the terrain is to just run a hill shade which um, if you've done before that's great and if you haven't this is where you find it right here it's under analysis and then hill shade um, it's a GDAL tool there's a couple different ones you can use um, Saga has a nice kind of, they call it an analytical hill shade. I don't know what that really means, but um, but it creates a different version. And the default settings on these are usually fine. The light comes from the east-northeast and about 45 degrees off the, um, off the ground. And there's a bunch of settings you can try. But let's just go ahead and use the default settings and save the hill shade. I'm going to put it under my terrain. And for my shorthand, I usually just call, go HS for hill shade. And that way, if I try some different hill shades, um, I can do an underscore and then describe the things I do there. So I'm just going to run that. Um, this is a, I guess it's a pretty big file, so it might take your computer a couple seconds. Um, and this might even be too detailed, right? It's a pretty detailed hill shade. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll provide a sample for you guys for this week of something that's a little, a little coarser because you know it's might look a little busy as a base map, but we'll work with it for now. Um, and I think one of the things about hillshades is that sometimes hillshades can kind of muddle the composition because they're just so gray. And so um, I like to increase their contrast so that when I bring them into Illustrator, I can kind of make them very, very soft, but they still have an effect. If you were to make this really soft, it would just look gray probably. So what I do to stretch that is you go to properties and under symbology, um, these contrast enhancements and the mid max settings is where you kind of decide how how is the computer going to stretch bl black to white across the pixels and so um, the quick and easy way is just go cumulative count cut it's cutting out the extremes of the data um, by two percent on each side you hit apply and it just kind of makes a dramatically bolder kind of um, thing to look at which you know it's not attractive at the moment but when we bring it into a design program we can soften it and it'll it'll do the trick so I like to play with these that's great um, now what I'd like to do is create what's called a hypsometric tint and a lot of 
is kind of the traditional way to to enhance a hillshade so that places that are high appear a certain color and places that are low appear a different color as well. So you can just take your, your regular DEM here and we're going to go to properties and under symbology we go to single band pseudo color. What I would do here is we want to find a color ramp. Right now there's no color ramp. Um, and we want to create a new color ramp. So right now some of the defaults would be fine. We could do greens if we wanted to. Um, you know, hit apply. You can start to see what things look like. You can play around with what they have. Um, but I, I think I want to create one because you know, hypsometric tints are um, usually kind of a certain style that the eye understands. So this is a pretty, yeah, here's a good example, right? This is a hypsometric tint that's blended with a hill shade where things that are low tend to be kind of green as if they're more lush and things that are higher tend to be a pale kind of yellow or tan and sometimes into white to to mimic kind of a, an arid mountainside or something like that. And so it's it's just a style choice, but I, th I think it a lot of people expect to see it and and therefore it's a good thing to know how to do. So back here we'll go to um, we're not going to use one of their color ramps we're going to create a color lamp a color ramp so create new color ramp and we want it to be a gradient meaning this is a pixel gradient right that's one of our terms for the course. Um, you could do other there's other choices but we're going to create a gradient and it comes in with this default thing here, um, but it's it's kind of it seems like a cumbersome tool, but once you get used to it, it, it works pretty well, and you can kind of come up with some nice stuff. And I think I'm going to let you figure out how to use this. I'll do a couple of quick things here, and you can you can take it from there. So it, it runs by you double clicking, and you can kind of put color stops, and then it tells you what the relative position of each stop is as a percentage from zero to a hundred. And um, so, you know, you kind of get the sense you just you click one and then you choose, OK, I want that to be dark green and then you can choose another green or a yellow or something like that. Um, and then, you know, you can kind of decide how you want it to go. So I'm not going to overthink this. Um, that's good enough for for my purposes. I just kind of made four gradient stops and then told it to go from a color to a color to a color. Um, there is the danger that you you just do this for hours and then it still looks bad. So um, within reason, spend some time uh, figuring out how this tool works. So I select that color ramp, I'm going to hit apply and um, you know, it looks kind of yucky but I'm, I'm okay with it for the moment. So what I would tend to do now is um, and in the next in the next Illustrator video I'll show you how I I compile these in Illustrator to um, to create an attractive um, terrain map. Um, just really quick, you can kind of see that if you were to make both of these semi-transparent, then they're going to blend and look more attractive together than they would look alone. So if I make these semi-transparent, you know, you start to get this kind of feel that this is a landscape and it's ruffled and there's places that are high and low and, you know, you turn on the water and suddenly you've, you have the makings of a of a, of a good reference map. Um, but I'll let you mess with that as you wish. Um, the last thing I'd like to do in this video is show you how to make contours. And the first thing about making contours is that um, if you just use this extraction contour tool, um, it's going to use the base unit, which right now we have the x, y units are meters for this hillshade. We know that because of the coordinate system. Sorry, not this hillshade, this DEM. Um, but also the vertical units are in meters, and that's something you need to you need to know when you're working with DEMs is what is the vertical unit reporting. And most of the national elevation data set comes in meters. So we could just use a unit multiplier here and tell it to be um, what is it 3.028 or 28 something for creating um, feet as our our intervals for the contours. But I think it's easier sometimes to just multiply the DEM by a number so that when we 
say 10 feet or 50 feet or 100 feet that the attributes of the resulting contour file will actually be in a in they'll be clean um, units they're not going to be some decimal that's in meters so um, I would suggest using the 30 meter DEM that I have provided you instead of this DEM for this tutorial and I'll, and I'll make sure to put that 30 meter DEM in here so that if your computer is running this it's not running a half a gigabyte file um, every time you run a tool so I'm going to take that DEM and I'm multiplying it it's in meters by oh gosh I should know this one by heart too um, meters to feet 3.28084 right so 3.28084 and so now I'm going to save this under my data terrain and I call this DEM vertical units are feet and um, I'm just gonna yeah that's good that's good enough so I'll do that and I say okay so that ran and that is fine there, there it is. And now I'm going to run, um, let's just try uh, 20 foot contours. So now I go to extraction, contour, I'm going to take my DEM vertical units feet and say 20 and save the contours to uh, this terrain file and I'm going to call these 20 feet going to run it and so that if you tried to run that um, 20 foot contour on your computer with this 10 meter DEM it might have gotten in trouble but if you run it on the 30 meter it probably should be fine so there you have it you've, you've got some contours now you know we could pretty easily make these some kind of brown let's see See, it's having some problems here. Um, we'll get into symbology in the next video, but um, it, you know that'll be an Illustrator video. But you can kind of see that with a little bit of contour action and a little bit of um, hill shade and hypsometric tint and some water, you you can pretty easily make your own custom um, topographical map, which um, is sometimes nicer than the the stock maps that were given. So. Hope this was informative. Uh, see you in the next video where we, we actually create some maps um, from our data and from our reference material.